We are live. Uh, I'm Ben Omni uh, on behalf of Legacy Flight Academy. Uh, welcome to our uh, per virtual PAR event uh, here with uh, Lieutenant Darian Haynes, which uh, we're happy to have. Uh, and this particular week is a special week because we've got uh, Elizabeth City uh, State University, and we're doing the Drone Experience Academy. Um, so uh, this should be very informative. Looking uh, forward to hearing your story and, uh, and your journey. Uh, and especially how that relates to uh, unmanned aerial vehicles. So I will, uh, I'll let you take it away and I will uh, disappear. All righty, thank you so much. Um, as mentioned, my name is Second Lieutenant Darian Haynes. Um, first of all, I wanted to say thank you to LFA for um, having me here in order to speak. This has been so awesome and I'm very excited to kind of shed some light on the RPA community and then just kind of talk about what I've been doing within that community. I'm going to share my screen real quick. Stand by. Well, hopefully everyone is seeing this. Um, so, as mentioned, I'm going to just be talking about the RPA life. I am Second Lieutenant Darian Haynes. Starting it off, oops, sorry about that, starting it off, so we're going to be talking about my background, just so everyone kind of knows who I am, what I've been doing, where I came from. Um, so, I am a military life brat. Um, both of my parents seen in this picture down here. Um, they were both active duty military. They were both enlisted. In fact, they retired out of Randolph Air Force Base. So if you remember that, it's going to be an important part of my story that comes up later on as well. Um, so with that military life, I then went to college. I went to Baylor University, so sick and bears. My story, however, is a little bit different from most officers that you talk to simply because um, a lot of them either go through ROTC or they go through the academy. There's not really a ton of Air Force officers that come through OTS, which is Officer Training School. Um, while I was at Baylor, I decided my junior, or going into my senior year of college that I wanted to join the military. One, because I knew that the health benefits are very good within the military. Specifically, you don't have to pay for um, a lot of your health care, which is a huge incentive to me. Also, I knew going after my senior year of college graduating, I would want to eventually get my master's and master's on its own is super expensive. So I didn't have the money for it at the time. And while I was working at a mail center on base, I kind of decided, hey, like this would be a great place to get a big family and just to meet other people different than the people that I just grew up with. I am an only child. So that idea of having a bigger family and also being a part of something a lot bigger than myself was something that I um, wanted for my life. So with that being said, I started doing the application process within my senior year of college um, in order to go to officer training school. Fast forward a year after graduation, I was picked up originally to be a CISO, which is a combat systems officer. Um, with that, you have to do any, with any of your rated career fields, you do have to go do a flight physical. When I did the flight physical for the CISO position, um, I was medically disqualified from the CISO position. However, I was picked up for RPA, which is remotely piloted aircraft officer. Um, and with that, as mentioned, I was born in, or not born, but I grew up in San Antonio, Texas. And then the training for RPA is actually in San Antonio, Texas of the same base. So instead of having this huge grandiose travel adventure moving across the world to a different state or even to a different continent, I ended up going right back home, which I do not mind because I was able to spend more time with my family. Um, so it was a blessing, but I was like, man, I am not going to be able to travel all that much right now. 
Um, so this picture up here in the top right, that is my OTS picture. Since both of my parents were in and they were both enlisted, when you become an officer, you can get a first salute, um, which is essentially the someone of the enlisted side will give you your first salute ever as being an officer. And because both of my parents were both in, I wanted both of them to do it, which is super bittersweet um, for that. Officer training school is a huge, um, a huge time to kind of develop who you are, what you're doing, what kind of leader you're going to be, and what kind of leader you want to be, as well as learning just the basic military functions and all of that good stuff of how the Air Force operates. For myself, my story, once again, is a little bit different because I did go through OTS twice. Um, the first time I went was in January 2018 to February of 2018. Um, I had gotten sick and got sent home, but I persevered, which is going to come later on into the lessons learned. With that perseverance, I was like, I want to be an Air Force officer, so no matter how it's going to take me, I'm going to make sure that I go and work my butt off so that way I can become an Air Force officer. So then I went back the second time um, from September of 2018 to November of 2018. So thankfully I was able to still go within that same year. And then this picture up here is the picture after I finally got my first salutes from my parents and after I finally took the oath of office where I became a second lieutenant of the Air Force. Okay, um, so just to kind of then transition to my flying career. Um, so with the flight training pipeline, especially for RPAs, it looks a little bit different than you would have for traditional um, man pilots and then for even CISOs um, as well. So for the first part, you go through initial flight training, which happens in Pueblo, Colorado. So this is my first picture up in that top right of when I first soloed an aircraft. Um, yeah, flight, flight training up, up in Pueblo, Colorado, that was a super difficult time because you transitioned from just solely academics or being strong, at least for myself, in one set of skills to realizing, hey, now I have to have a physical set of skills that were not quite up to par for myself at the moment. Um, it was just a super tough time of figuring out what my capabilities are. And with that, um, I had ended up getting to an 89 flight, which is essentially the flight that determines whether or not you're going to continue with um, the flight training or if you're going to actually be washed out and do a different career in the Air Force. Thankfully, I was able to pass that flight and I was able to continue on with my Air Force training um, with being an RPA pilot. The second bullet completed RAQ and RFC. So what that essentially is, is for RPA individuals going through training, we have to learn how to fly an aircraft on instruments. Um, so that way, if we ever had to get into the moment of, um, yes, so if we ever have to get into the moment of, hey, we're going to need to fly in any kind of instrument weather, um, then we would have the knowledge and the wherewithal in order to do that. This was all done simulator based. So when other manned pilots go through the pipeline, they're going to be flying a T-6, which is the traditional aircraft that all um, people going through training will fly. However, for ourselves, since we're not going to be in the aircraft, um, RIQ and RFC are both done in simulator based training. For RFC, that's going to transition out of the T-6 and more specifically to how RPAs are going to be flown which I'll show in um, some slides afterwards. So I ended up getting my wings and graduating from that program on the 28th of February, which is awesome. And then this picture is something that I'm super excited about just because during that time, I know how hard I had worked up until that moment. I had gotten the academic award overall for all of my class. And then I had just gotten my wings pinned on. So it was a super um, exciting time for both myself and all of my classmates as well. Now, currently, um, I am here at Hallman Air Force Base. I'm going through IQT, which, the, which is the initial qualifi qualification training. So with that, I'm taking all of my knowledge of how to maintain aircraft control, how to fly an aircraft, and I'm tailoring those skills to just be solely based on how to fly an MQ-9, how to fly an RPA specifically, instead of how to fly a more traditional military um, 
military asseted aircraft. So, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. Um, so that being said, transitioning to what I am doing specifically for being an RPA pilot, um, a big thing that I'm going to try to help dispel is just the difference between a drone and a difference between an unmanned aircraft vehicle. So a lot of people, when they hear RPA, they automatically equate it to drone, which isn't really the same thing. For drones, they are more so robots. Um, anyone can go and get their drone license and just kind of fly the drones using like a little controller of the sorts. Um, versus unmanned aircrafts are actually a lot heavier and they're a lot, well, caveat to that, there are different kinds of UAVs, but more essentially, they require having, um, they require having the aircraft, the payload, which is essentially the cameras. They have a control element that's on the ground. They also have a support element as well, and then they also have comms. Another thing that kind of varies as well is that most of the UAVs utilize satellite in order to, um, in order for the aircraft itself to fly. So that's the big difference between a drone and a UAV. Now between a drone, or excuse me, a UAV and other types of RPAs, so it's split into different categories. You have a category one, two, all the way through five. The one I'm gonna be focusing on today are the category five RPAs, which essentially, which is the RQ-4, which is gonna be this aircraft up in the top right. Um, it's also called the Global Hawk, and then I'm also going to differentiate that between the MQ-9 Reaper, which is the air, airplane that I fly. So for that Global Hawk, it doesn't have any weapons on it, no weapons at all. All it's really going to do is just focus a lot on the ISR aspect of the mission, which is just intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. Um, it is able to go a lot further up in the sky, so that way you can get a lot more coverage and just be the eye on the sky and getting all of the intelligence, getting all of the imagery that we would use in order to find different people that we need to find. Um, yeah, just to find different people that we need to find. Now, in order to differentiate that between the Reaper, the Reaper is also going to do ISR. We're also able to loiter for a long amount of time just because we don't have anyone in the aircraft, so we don't have to worry about essentially the safety of the pilot that's in the aircraft. So we're able to loiter um, a lot longer. What the MQ-9 has that the Global Hawk does not have is that um, there are weapons. So we are able to employ weapons on our enemies if we are given the go-ahead, um, which is kind of depending upon why some people choose the Global Hawk versus why people choose the Reaper, just depending upon what you wanna do with your career. Um, with that aircraft. So as mentioned on the side, it has roles, ISR, engaged targets, close air support, CSAR, which is combat search and rescue, and then we do provide overwatch as well as the Global Hawk. We do have an MTS, which is mentioned from a previous slide. We have a payload, which is a camera. So the MTS, multi-spectral targeting system, is what is going to allow for that camera to function, for us to have a better eyes on for any of the individuals that we have on the ground. That weapon loadout, as you can read here, so we are able to have, excuse me, a lot of precision guided bombs that are super heavy and do a lot of big booms. And then we also have some hellfires as well that we can carry, that we can employ um, whenever we're called fit to employ. And with how that operates, that last bullet, remotely split operations. So with that being said, I could be somewhere here, currently I'm here in New Mexico, and the airplane could actually be somewhere overseas, like in Afghanistan or Iraq or any place like that, and I would still be having all of the control of it while being somewhere, he somewhere different than where the airplane is actually located. So that's what remotely split operations, that's what that means. Oh my goodness. Um, so the capabilities, I didn't really put any bullets just because the pictures sort of speak for themselves. So the first picture that we have up in the top right, that's gonna be your GDT or ground data terminal. So when I was mentioning the remote split ops, what that is essentially allowing for us to do is allowing for the airplane from within our GCS, which is a ground central, ground central station, um, 
for that, we're going to allow different data links and different satellites to be able to talk to the actual aircraft. This GDT is what's going to allow that, um, allow that data link to go to the aircraft to perform whatever we're trying to make it do. For example, if I wanted to make a left turn, it would, it would take the controls that I put on the ground, it would send it up through the satellite in the terms of like an electronic emission, and then it will send it back to the aircraft and so on and so forth after the aircraft does that action. Um, so that's how we operate our aircraft instead of in a normal airplane or a traditional airplane, they make a left turn and it makes a left turn right then. And you're like, cool, great. Versus us, we have at least a three second delay. Um, so that's something to consider whenever we're trying to do moving targets or anything like that, because we do have a sensor, which I'm gonna talk to in just a second, um, that's going to be the one controlling the camera, controlling what we're looking at. This picture that's in the bottom left, hand corner, you're going to see a lady that's on the left and then a man that's sitting on the right. So how our crew operates, because for traditional airplanes, you either have a single seater or you have a full blown crew. Um, it just kind of depends. For our, air, for our air crew, we have a GCS, as mentioned, the ground central station. Then within that, you have a pilot, such as myself, and then you have an enlisted member who's going to be the sensor operator. So with the sensor operator, what their main duty is, is one, to control all of the cameras and what we're looking at. Um, so they are really a big asset when it comes to moving targets because they are the ones trying to keep the crosshairs that we have of the camera, of the NTS, on that target. So in case we decide to do a weapons deployment on that target, their whole job is making sure that, hey, I'm guiding that into the right target and not something completely off. Um, for the pilot, our job is to make sure that we don't fly anywhere we're not supposed to fly, making sure that the aircraft is functioning the way it's supposed to. Um, we function the same way as traditional pilots. We just have the additional of a sensor operator who would back us up on any of the other components as well as making sure their crosshairs are on the correct placement of whatever target we're looking at. Also, that picture is showing you what a general GCS looks like, at least the GCS is here at Holloman. Um, you have about seven screens, and as you can see, you have one at the very top, you have one at the middle, and then one at the bottom, which is a combination of screens. Then you also have two out to the side, both the bottom and the top. So it makes for an interesting cross check or moving your eyes around in order to make sure that each component is on the correct, essentially that your aircraft is flying appropriately and that you're also making sure you're talking to the correct agencies, that your aircraft is in the airspace, that all of your um, functional parts of your aircraft are working appropriately and then just doing all of that fun stuff. So it's a good it's an interesting time that I thought I was going to be like, wow, there's so many screens. I don't know where to place my eyeballs. Um, but once you get the hang of it, it starts to become a little bit easier and a better flow when you get more comfortable. Um, this bottom right hand picture, um, that's showing you how big the actual aircraft is. I know some people when I say, oh, I'm an RPA pilot, they're like, oh, so you fly these little bitty things. And I'm like, no, not, not really. So this airplane is actually very, very large. Um, it can hold up to 10,500 pounds. And that's including all of the weapons because uh, the GBU weapons, you can look it up online. They're about 500 pound bombs themselves. Um, so it is a massive size, or not massive, but it is a larger size bird in comparison to the small little drones that are being flown um, by drone pilots as well. Then this, I don't know if you can see my mouse, right here where I put my mouse towards the bottom of the aircraft, that is the MTS. So that is the ball that hangs off of the nose of the aircraft that will turn around. Um, so that way we can get a full 365 degree picture on whatever we're looking at from above the sky. Okay, and then lastly, so this is just my lessons learned as like officership and what I've learned over the course of my almost two years in the Air Force. Um, it's not entirely related to RPA, it's related to whatever you're doing, even if it's not in the Air Force, bloom where you're planted. Um, 
specifically in the Air Force, lots of things are changing. Um, the second one, flexibility is the key to air power. Those both tie hand in hand. In order to be flexible, um, you have to bloom where you're planted. You have to be the best that you can be at what you are at that moment in time. Learn your craft and learn it well. And then with that, you'll be placed in different positions um, that you might not necessarily know the answers to or how to go about doing whatever problem you may be given. So that's where the flexibility comes in as well. Um, knowing your GK. So GK stands for general knowledge. I am not the best pilot. Like my physical abilities and flying have not quite matched my educational and knowledge aspects of flying. Um, but I know what has helped me out a lot is by knowing my general knowledge, knowing what the different pubs say and that has helped me out a ton because when I'm not able to eloquently show it through my motions and through my actions, I'm able to speak to it. And that way my um, IPs or just other individuals around me know she knows what she's talking about. She just, her hand eye coordination isn't the best. And then lastly, make connections. And this just goes for both outside of the Air Force and within the Air Force, making connections wherever you go. You never know where it's going to lead you. For example, um, with myself, I did not know Legacy Flight Academy existed, but I was able to um, I was able to join an organization called Debt One, and with them, they have allowed me the opportunity to make so many different connections that I wouldn't have ha had otherwise. Um, so making connections is very important because you never know where that's going to lead you in the future. Um, so yeah, that was my quick synopsis of my lessons learned. But that kind of concludes my overall brief, overall summary of RPAs, what the difference between Cat 5s of like a Global Hawk and then an MQ-9. So yeah, if anyone has any questions or if you want to take over, it's all you. Well, one, uh, I enjoyed that. I'm going to jump in real quick and say for those that are watching on, on Facebook, because it is up on, on Facebook now, that if they got oh, questions, uh, feel free to put them in the comments there, and, and uh, I'll definitely make sure that she's uh, able to answer those. Uh, I'm not sure. We've got at least 10 people in the room if they got questions as well. There's a Q&A function where you can uh, raise your hand and, and, and ask if you want. Um, the first question that I have off the top of my head uh, is, Obviously, the, the, the Reaper, for any UAV for that matter, can probably fly a lot longer than the, the normal human can stand to sit there. Is, there. is there a limit for you guys of how long you can, you can sit in a seat? Or generally um, speaking, do you so, think there's a, a standard mission length, something like that? Mm -hmm. So most of our, and I will caveat all of this, saying like this is just basically, this is based off of only information that I have of not being operational yet, um, but from my understanding that each of the mission links, at least in Canon, from what I've heard, is eight hours long. So we will be eight hours in the seat um, doing whatever we're tasked to do during that day. It can go longer, um, especially being in the AFSOC community. Um, there's just different times in which it, being in the seat may take longer. So. At least I know it's a minimum of eight hours is what I've heard consistently for both ACC, Air Combat Command, and then AFSOC, um, the Special Operations Command, so. Is the seat really comfy? Um, it is, so like eight so hours we actually, worth. <laughs> it is. Um, the only thing is the GCS is freezing because we have so many high-tech computers. So it's very, very cold. And even when I'm in there for two hours, it'll be like 108 degrees out in Holloman. And then you'll get in, you'll be like, wow, this is so nice. And then by the end, your fingers are like, I can't, I can't move because you're super cold. And then you're back out to the heat. But the seats are very comfy um, and they also have heat warmers. So it's, a, it's nice to kind of put your booty in and enjoy that time, at least for here in training when you're not stress free or not stressed out. But yeah, they are super comfy. It looks like you got a, a q and I don't know if you see that box there down at the bottom. I do. That's, that's yes, I Let can me, answer that question. Um, the last one I just posted oh. by someone that I think you might might know. 
<laughs> yes, I, I do know that person. And I feel like Karen Haynes, I would love to answer your question. Um, I do like being an RPA pilot, not a drone pilot, but I do like being an RPA pilot. I think for myself, um, at first I was super apprehensive because I was like, man, this is just going to be just like a video game. Like, I'm not going to have fun at all. Like, whatever. Um, as I've grown to know more about the community and more about what I'm doing, I am absolutely thrilled that I'm going to be able to do that just because RPAs were able to have direct oversight and overwatch on all of our people on the ground. So I have some friends going through PJ training and I would know that, hey, I'm going to be directly overwatching them and making sure that they're safe. And if need be, dropping some things on some people, given the right, um, given the right guidance and knowing that I will be directly responsible for their safety. And for me, that's one of the biggest reasons I wanted to join, especially join AFSOC, because for me, that is very important. Because like I said, I wanted to join and have a big family. So if I can directly help and support that big family, like that is my bread and butter. So I do like being an RPA pilot. Right now, sometimes it's getting a little stressful because we just keep incorporating more and more of our training. But I think once I'm able to get out there and be operational, I think that it's going to be a sweet spot for my career. So, yeah. And then I do see how do you apply for the OTS route and how long did that process take? Um, so in order to apply for OTS, how it works is you can start the application process within a year of graduation. Um, so if you're graduating, let's say, spring of 2021, um, you can start applying within spring, or excuse me, fall of 2020. That's what I did. So that way I knew by the time I graduated, I had a job, all depending upon passing OTS, but at least I knew what my next step of my life was after graduation. Um, for that, in order to start getting that process sort of going, you'll want to talk to a recruiter. Um, the recruiter could be a recruiter near Stu. Um, that's what I kind of did. And then with that, they'll be asking you like some general questions just to make sure, hey, is this person qualified to be in the Air Force? Um, after that, you have three different types of tests that you'll take. The first one is your AFOQT. Um, the AFOQT is the Air Force Officer Qualifying Test. With that, it's kind of similar to a your SATs. Um, maybe your GRE, but most definitely your SATs. With that, you're going to have a couple of different sections. It's going to be reading, science, writing, and then you'll also have the pilot and navigation section. Um, so I, even if you're not considering pilot, I would just go ahead and study for all of it in totality because you never know what's going to happen, just like myself. Um, so with that, you'll have those different five sections. It is a time test. Once you're done, um, you just kind of leave and you'll get your results later on. There's another test that you'll take. It's called your TBAS, which is a test of basic aviation skills. With that, you're just, they're just trying to see if you would be good within flight training. Um, it deals a lot with like multitasking, kind of seeing how well your physical limit your physical abilities will go along well with the RPA, or not RPA, excuse me, but with the pilot community as well. And then you'll get an overall te test score, which is going to be your PICSIN score, your pilot candidate selection method score, and that's ranked out of, I believe, zero to 100. Um, if you do start to have, if you do have flight training hours before, um, like if you happen to get some hours at your local airport, that does increase your score just based off the fact that you have some flight hours. So there's actually only two tests, but those are the two tests that you would take. Following that, you will also have an interview with the recruiters of your squadron, or like, excuse me, the commander of the recruiting squadron that you're under. Um, that interview is just to kind of get a more holistic view of like, hey, why do you want to join the Air Force? Can they see you as being an officer in the Air Force? Because another important thing to note is that not only are you an operator, so not only are you an aviator, but you're an officer first. So that's something super important that they want to make sure we're not just sending people who can like fly really well, but we're also sending people out who are going to be able to um, assist other airmen and assist other people 
as well to ensure that we have a holistic view of our Air Force and we have good people leading our Air Force. That is a general basis of the OTS route. Um, the How long the process takes kind of depends. Um, there are not that many officer recruiters within the United States, so they have a lot more workload than the enlisted recruiters or individuals in recruiting enlisted members. Um, so it just kind of depends on how big their workload is, how persistent you are, um, just if you're able to get everything um, into order, get it sent fast, all of that good stuff. It just kind of depends. For me, it happened, I started the process around August of 2018. I had, I met the board, which is just a group of members who are coming and they're looking at all the packages that are being placed. Um, so for myself, all of the, all the people that are being placed at a specific time, it was like in October. So I had put in my package by October and I heard my decision in March of 2017. So it was a little, little under a year, but also I have a super fast pace and that's not normally the case. So hopefully that answers all of your questions about that. Okay, I have next question. So proud that in spite of hard times and disappointment, we are inspired and encouraged to see what you are doing. Oh, great, that was not a question, but thank you, I appreciate it. Um, then I have another one, how fast is the NQ9 Reaper? So we're actually not super fast at all. Um, mostly we are flying around at um, normally 120 knots, which is not super fast in comparison to like the Strike Eagle or anything like that. Yeah, I can't really equate them, but I do know that we're not super fast. Um, our, the fastest that we can go is 200 knots, and then our max exceed speed is 230 knots. So yeah. Sorry, I can't super equate it, but we do not fly super fast at all just because we want to make sure we have the ability to have a good look sees over everything and loiter over everything. So, I'll jump in real um, quick because I got one we, from Facebook. Oh, yes, go for it. Uh, the question is, uh, how hard is it to overcome the control delay between controlling inputs uh, of the aircraft and actually like executing? So obviously I would say a normal pilot, you're in the plane, you've got that instant feedback. What's it like flying a plane that's probably, you know, halfway around the world or something like that? Is there a, a difference that you, you feel in that? Um, so I can see personally, there is a difference. Um, we do have a three second, three millisecond delay, which might not seem like a lot, but it is, especially with my sensor. Um, so I am not at all like really good at any of the flying and then he's also learning his sensor stuff as well so one of the things i kind of came up with to help him because we do a lot of moving target engagement so we see a car on the highway and they're like follow the car um so i have to kind of tell him hey i'm gonna bank this way because i'll like put in the input and then in three milliseconds after i put in the input is when it actually does its turn um, so it just kind of makes for having to think outside of the box and think ahead of the aircraft and that's what is going to play a factor in to how well we can best manipulate the aircraft. Because I know sometimes for moving targets in the very beginning, I'd put in an input and my sensor would be like, okay, I have my input for the cameras and then I'd be like, oh, I made the wrong input, let me go like fast to the other way and it would throw him off significantly just because I didn't tell him which way I was going, and that is something that we would talk about in the future and like making sure that we know, hey, if I put in this input, I'm gonna let you know, so that way he can better assist and better facilitate that movement. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and then I have a question. Are we starting to see more females in the RPA program? I would hope so. Um, I haven't seen like a lot of, I haven't been super up to date about who all's coming in, but I do start to see that there is an increasing amount of females going to the RPA program. Um, at least I know in my class we had three females, two Air Force, one was a Marine, and then the upcoming classes we have had significantly more females coming through, which is great because um, it's 
nice to see girls, at least other people that you can relate to going through the same program with you, just because they may think differently than you. Can you at, and you can ask those questions without, I don't know, it seeming without it being awkward or whatever. But um, I'm hoping that we're starting to see more females in our program. I just don't know where those numbers are currently. Are there any safety issues involved in being a, an RPA pilot? So safety issues, I mean, in terms of all of the pilots and the crew members, there are, there's none. Um, I know with, if there's ever any thunderstorms, we may have some thunder strikes that occur to the GCS and that may affect things. Um, we may have some smoke or fire in, in the GCS that's actually an emergency procedure. But other than that, we would just hop out of the aircraft. Because we're not in the aircraft, however, we do have to have what is called an emergency mission. So with that emergency mission, it is just a pathway that leads you back to a specific place. So for here at Holloman, most of all of our emergency procedures leave us back to Holloman. And what that's going to allow the airplane to do is if the airplane loses link or if it loses any of the connection to the satellite and you no longer have control of the aircraft, the aircraft is automatically going to fly itself back. So that way the ground control unit or the LRE, which just stands for launch and recovery element, they will come and they will take the aircraft in a different set of um, links. It's called a line of sight link. And then with that, they're going to be able to take the aircraft and land it safely. So that's the only big safety issue is that just like the as you've seen in like iRobot or something like that, if the airplane decides to go off willy nilly, you can't really control it because you're not in the aircraft. Um, so yeah, that's one of the main safety issues that at least we try to mitigate is by having that emission updated appropriately. So that way, if it does happen to fly, um, it will go to a place that everyone knows where it's going to. So it can be picked up and landed safely. Okay, and then I have, can you explain again and slash expand on grow where you're planted? Yes, so I have been told that multiple times in my Air Force career, and it's definitely true. Um, Canon is where I have selected to go. That was my number one choice. All before selecting there, I heard lots of negative things about Canon, like, oh, it sounds like cow poop and like there's nothing to do there or any of that. Um, but I truly believe that you can make any place beautiful and you can, you can enjoy all the smaller aspects that people might not necessarily care for um, in any base that you go to. So even if there's not a lot of stuff to do, you find stuff to do and you make it your home because that is where the Air Force wanted you to be for a certain amount of years. So that bloom slash grow where you're planted, um, embrace the culture of where you're going to and embrace what you can learn from it and learn from it, like be an open sponge to learning anything and everything that you have from, from that aspect of where you're gonna be at that time. So that's what bloom slash grow, grow where you're planted means. Um, okay, I have another one. How important do you feel that learning to actually fly an aircraft is when piloting an RPA? Some would think it's like a game. How important was learning to fly an actual aircraft? Um, so with that, like I will say with Corona, a lot of RPA pilots are actually not going to DOS or going to Pueblo, Colorado, which is the initial flight training before they learn how to fly the T6 simulator. Um, in terms of basic fundamentals of flying, I think it's super important and super imperative to know. Um, just know, having a good ground school would probably be super helpful and super beneficial. Because when I was going through, I didn't know the mechanics of how the engine worked, how flight worked, um, or just like the aerodynamics of like, hey, this is how you fly an aircraft and this is how it functions. So I think that part is what is actually very important into learning how to fly an aircraft in totality. In terms of flying the RPA, I mean, 
everything is a computer. Um, like the the computer itself does a lot of the um, the functions and the calculations to be like, oh well you have fuel that's pulling from this wing, so let me counteract that and make your wing on this side a lot higher. And just, it's easier for the computer to do it, but still there are times when like maybe your computer stops working where you have to fly the aircraft by itself. So recognizing the dynamics of like your pitch and power settings and then what's gonna happen when you do this versus that, that is important. Um, just to have a background knowledge on. So I would say altogether it's important important to learn how to fly an aircraft. I think DOS is important. RIQ, we don't really do a lot of the instruments, instrumentations with the MQ-9 just because we're always flying in, um, we're not flying in instrument conditions. So I don't know, I can't really say. I, I just know for me, I enjoyed having the background knowledge of how to fly an actual aircraft because it helped out with the um, increasing knowledge of how to fly an, R an RPA, so. Yeah. I got a question for you. Okay. So you, you said that you generally didn't grow up in aviation and it actually wasn't something that you uh, looked for like as a, as a career per se. Would you say that now being uh, an RPA pot, has this, do you have any desire to do any flying, say, outside of work? Because obviously flying as a job is, is still a job first and foremost. Mm -hmm. uh, but has this maybe sparked a fire? Would you, do you, would you pursue a private pot license or, or flying on the outside, something like that? Yeah, actually I would. But like before all of Corona happened, I was telling my parents, I was like, yeah, I'm going to like go get my private pilot's license because the drive from like here to New Mexico is about eight and a half hours, nine hours. I was like, yeah, parents, I'm going to get my PPL and then I'll come and I'll fly down to get you and then we can come and spend the weekend and it'll be great. So I do still want to pursue my PPL and my private pilot's license just to have that knowledge of being able to fly on my own. Now, I don't, I know I do have a lot of friends who are considering like, yeah, once our six years is up, um, we're gonna try to transition, or even after the two years is up, since they have their wings, we're gonna try to transition into man pilot. And I was like, y'all do it. I am going to enjoy my RPA, but definitely outside of work, I would wanna have that knowledge and to be able to just fly so yeah, for sure. Awesome, I dig it. <laughs> cool, well, questions? yeah, if, if other people don't have any more questions, we'll give a, a few, a couple few minutes here, uh, just to make okay. sure we didn't miss anything on, on Facebook as well. But uh, I definitely wanna say thank you. I learned a lot. I haven't sat down and chatted with an, with an RPA pop before. So there's definitely things that I, I, I did not know. Uh, so I personally enjoyed it. I know LFA uh, appreciates this, uh, along with uh, Elizabeth City State University, just getting a, an inside look there. So yeah, for sure. Yeah, I am super appreciative that I was able to come and just kind of talk about the RPAs, just because no one really knows what we do outside of being like, yeah, y'all are drones and y'all do things, and we're like, yeah, kind of, sort of. So it's really, it's really great to be able to kind of talk about it and stuff like that just because it's starting to become something I'm more passionate about one it being my career and then two just because there's not a lot of people who know about it and it's such an awesome career field that does awesome things and we don't do it as much in the spotlight as other manned aircrafts and like CISOs and ABMs and stuff like that so it's awesome I'm glad I was able to come out and speak about it so cool Awesome. Well, for those that uh, missed the first half, you know, this is on beha behalf of Legacy Flight Academy. Uh, it's awesome that we get to do the things that we do, like presentations like this, uh, through volunteers like your like yourself. And um, please check out our website, LegacyFlightAcademy.org. We're on Facebook. We're on Instagram. Uh, we're always accepting donations so we can continue to do these these big things in the future and continue to inspire uh, more people as well. So we have uh, another one of these tomorrow, uh, and we have one on. Get the times here for you. 
So we have another one of these tomorrow at uh, 1.30 Eastern time, another one on Wednesday, excuse me, the 15th at two o'clock and then Thursday at two o'clock as well. And then Friday, or excuse me, Friday will be off. Saturday, we have legacy flights across America, which will be huge, which will be on here uh, as well as, uh, as Facebook, um, which is going to be huge. This is us doing uh, discovery flights, if you will, for kids across the nation. Uh, on the East Coast, on the West Coast, it'll be all at the same time on a live stream. Uh, we'll hopefully have uh, General McGee as well giving us some, some input on this uh, momentous weekend because it's the anniversary of the first graduating class at Tuskegee Airmen. So uh, with that said, thank you once again for this, this presentation uh, on behalf of Legacy Flight Academy. Hope to see you guys tomorrow uh, and we'll see you later.